We are having technical difficulties this morning. Thank you, sister. We, uh, I'm not sure how it happened, but we were having more. This is, is going to be one of those kind of days. It's going to be all right. Um, we lost our lyrics to the songs this morning. Hallelujah. Oh, Josh is doing his magical, amazing thing. So, um, I... Thank you. Still working out the kinks. I forgot to, uh, during our announcement time, I forgot to mention this morning that at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning, we have an adult Sunday school. It meets back in the Sunday school room. That's why we call it a Sunday school, because it's you're meeting in the Sunday school room. If we met in the kitchen, we would just call it a kitchen. But we don't. We meet in the Sunday school room. We just began a study on the book of James. We got through a half a verse. <laughs> It's going to be that kind of study. You're welcome to come. Bring a guest. Bring a friend. Um, come and bring your, uh, uh, bring your questions and even your arguments. And we'd love to entertain those ways. As long as you're arguing from a good heart, not from a bad heart. Not that kind of heart. Also, tonight at 630, uh, we're gathering here tonight again for worship and for Bible study. We're doing a, a Bible study called Foundations. And our topic tonight is the Lordship of Jesus. Really super important topic and a great topic. You are welcome as well. Please feel free to come. Bring a neighbor. Bring a friend. Everybody is welcome. And I'm glad that you're here. I knew I, I, I opened up next week's sermon I've already started on. I knew I was going to do that. All right. I think I turned it off. No, no. Okay. Okay. We are continuing our study of the Beatitudes. We're studying Matthew uh, chapter 6 and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. And we're remembering that the reason why Jesus taught this to his disciples, because, well, you and I are disciples, right? We're all disciples. Amen. Every single one of us who are born again in Jesus' name, with Christ in us and us in him, we are disciples. The Sermon on the Mount is, is the, the, the part of Scripture that teaches us how to be a disciple. If you want to be a disciple, it's a good idea to know how to be a disciple. And that's what we're doing today. Uh, tonight, uh, this morning, our study is called Focus of the Heart. And our main uh, passage is Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. I have a question. Does anybody recognize these? Binoculars. They're binoculars. Mm -hmm. What are binoculars for? To see things far away. Any other ideas? To clarify them, to bring, to bring things far away and into sharper focus, to make big things that are hard to understand into small things that may be easier to understand. You with me? In what areas of life might you and I use binoculars? To look at eagles. To look at eagles. Any specific ideas? I, I can help you if you'd like me to. To see nature? Anything else? Your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> I said the same thing, but I said hopefully not. <laughs> I, I first, I first, I bought my first pair of binoculars when I worked when I worked for the prison back when I was a very young man. I worked for the prison the, the prison in, uh, in Texas, and of course, every once in a while, they decided the, the, the people who lived there decided they needed a vacation, so they would take a hike through the woods, and um, it was my job to find them. I took that very seriously. Bought a big pair of binoculars. Man, these things were huge, like a week's pay. And I'm, I'm looking, and I, I, and I, that's when I learned how to start to love birds. I would see a bird in a tree. I'm looking for the guy. The guy's not there. I know the guy's not there. I, so I see a bird, and I see a bird, and this is me. Maybe it's, and I try to find him in my binoculars, and it'd always be five degrees off, up or down. I can never find the bird. But once I found him, you can key in on that bird and see all the details and, and the beautiful things about, about birds. That's how we even use binoculars. Matter of fact, uh, I guess it was last Monday, but Tina Marie and I were watching a movie called Hempstead. And it was a movie, it's kind of a silly movie. It, Diane Keaton was in the movie. She's always a very interesting actress. And uh, you can discern that however you want to, and that's fine. Um, but we, we, were, we were watching this movie, and uh, basically the, the movie was this. this. Diane Keaton played a widower. She lived in England. She was an American living in England, and her husband had passed away. 
Don't know why he passed away. It wasn't part of the story. But he was, she was up in the attic of her, they call it a flat there. Isn't that kind of cool? She lived in a flat. I keep thinking about, like, beer flats. It's weird to me. Up in the attic, over her flat, and she's going through her husband's things, kind of being reminiscent and thinking about her husband and loving her husband, transitioning, helping her through her grief, and she found her husband's binoculars. Well, it just so happened that right above where she was sitting was an open window, and she stood up, and she got the binoculars out, and she's peeping around, and you know what she saw? She saw a homeless guy taking a bath in a pond, and then... Long story short, they fell in love at the end. Don't ask me about the middle. It was kind of weird. But it was a, it was a good movie. Binoculars come in handy for, uh, for all different kinds of reasons. They help us to see things far away, but more so they help us to focus on particular objects. Often when we see things far away without binoculars, we can still see them, but in order to really to focus in on them, we need the binoculars. It brings magnification, and it brings things into focus. Today, we are bringing into focus uh, this question. Okay, I keep up. Babe, push your phone a little higher. Push your thing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> Thank you. Putting into focus how we need our wives. Yes. Uh, uh, constantly. This is the question. Where is our heart focused? And by the way, I, I typically when I teach, I don't use the word you or your because I have three fingers pointed back at me. I need to ask myself these questions on a very regular basis. Where is my heart focused? And are they focused on things of the world or are they focused on things of heaven? Now, this is not a talk specifically about tithing. That's coming at another time, but as we continue to study... Uh, the Sermon on the Mount, a teaching that Jesus uses to introduce his disciples to being a disciple. We're following the theme of heart health and heart focus. Today we're focusing on money and stuff. Binoculars help us to put things into proper perspective, into a more realistic perspective. It helps us to focus on the specifics of the topic, and that's my prayer for us today. There's no guilt. No shame, no condemnation, but I'm prayerfully encouraging us to thoughtfully open our hearts to what the Spirit is saying. Let's pray. So, Father, use this time to open up our minds and our hearts to what your Word is saying. Help us to release any preconceived notions, any baggage, any hurt feelings, any, anything uh, connected to money, and, and help us to focus on, on what you would have us, the lesson you would have us learn, that you would have us learn. It's not coming from a neighbor or from our past or our own feelings about ourselves, but the lesson that you would have us learn. We ask these things because we need your help. We get stuck in, 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 in that wrong thinking and, and in places that, that we feel condemnation and guilt, but that's not from you. Set us all free today in Jesus' name. Amen. Confession. Well, two confessions actually. Today's our we have a council meeting today, and I always get kind of fired up for that, get ready to go, and I forgot to wear a belt. Oh, no. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to show you because that may not be appropriate. But if you see me hitching up my britches, that's because I forgot to wear a belt, and you should laugh at me because I deserve that. <laughs> Secondly, I grew up in a house that. Um, we're low, lower middle class, working class, blue collar folk. And sometimes when I think about money, when I think about things, there's some old childhood shadows that's still in me that, that feel guilty or, or, or ashamed or um, responsible for things that are outside of my control. So if I appear to be stumbling over my words, say a quick prayer for me, because it's hard for me to talk about money. This is, my, this is my confession, though, before we get started. The, the, the thing that, I, that I've learned with regards to money is this. It ain't mine. Nope. Ain't none of it mine. Ain't none of it is, does not belong to me. Everything that I have has been graced to me because of how Jesus loves me and he cares for me. Even people who are not Christians still receive that grace. And until they get to find it, their heart is never satisfied. I've learned that once I've let go of my things, 
I can live a life of much more satisfaction and happiness. It's when I start talking about it in public. Then those shadows kind of creep in and, and so just, I'm happy to know that I'm free and that I can give and I can give more than I think I'm able to give. I can give, I can give abundantly knowing that my father will take care of me as long as I'm faithful and a good steward of his resources. And that same truth is good for you as well today. So today we're going to use our spirit's binoculars and we're going to zero in and focus on what is truly, truly the most important things in our lives. This morning we'll find out three specific areas to focus on. Thank you, Jesus. Number one, we're going to focus on our heart. Secondly, we're going to focus on our eyes. And thirdly, we're going to focus uh, on our lives. If you're a note taker, that's your outline right there. <laughs> Number one, focus for our heart. Verse 19 of Matthew uh, chapter 6 says this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's a really tough concept. It's really convicting sometimes. It was for me in, in, in part of my life when I recognized that even, even outside of uh, not be trying to be evil or wicked or disobedient to Jesus, I was my treasure was placed in other places and other things. And not, by the way, not just my treasure of money, but also my treasure of time, also my treasure of talents, also my treasure of relationships. We're focused on things that satisfy me. The earthly things, earthly things, and not not up in heaven. It's a difficult, a difficult uh, transition for me to learn. Some of y'all are probably saying right now, "Well, there he goes, talking about stuff. He's talking about my stuff. This is my stuff. I worked hard for this stuff. He's trying to take away my stuff. I, I, I'm not going to feel guilty for having stuff. I have. It's my stuff. I'm going to do with what I want to do with it, preacher. Whatever you say is fine, but I'm going to do what I want to do." That's probably not a direct quote from anybody, but I'm sure it is from somebody that you might know. At least it is for me. Do you know that the seagull scene in Finding Nemo, in the very beginning of the movie, it's a really good animation. And yeah, yeah, exactly. The seagulls are flying around going, mine, 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 mine. And as they're doing all this, they're stealing hot dogs, they're stealing french fries, and knocking each other over, and stealing fish. Mine, 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 no matter what, it was theirs. Uh, I still find it strange to see seagulls in Wisconsin. It's still the weirdest thing to me. I, we're we're 1,200 miles away from the closest ocean. I just did that in my head. I could be wrong. And there's still seagulls flying around Wisconsin. Now, I understand why seagulls are here. Seagulls are doing here what seagulls do everywhere around the world. I get that. I grew up on the Gulf Coast of Texas. Uh, my wife grew up in the Southern California near the beautiful beaches in the Pacific Ocean. I've been on beaches all around the world. My dad was in there. been everywhere. And the seagulls are doing seagull things. And I'm here, and I'm walking around in fresh water, and seagulls are walking around. Mine, 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 mine. It's doing the very same thing. <laughs> I wonder if sometimes you and I behave like a seagull. I wonder that. And, and I wonder if we behave like a seagull to the extent of we'll make the stewardship decisions on our money or our stuff or our relationships or our time or our, our talents based upon what pleases me versus what pleases our Father. It's just a question. This morning in, in, the, in Sunday school, this is the reason why we got a half a verse done in a whole hour of study. Well, we prayed for one another, and we took testimonies, and that was sweet and good, and probably as important as anything we did. But we got stuck on the idea of what is a bondservant. And we began to unpack the idea of, of, of what it means to be a slave to Jesus. It was a good conversation. It was really edifying to me. Um, and you're welcome to come be part of that conversation as well. Guilty plug. Look, so look, there's nothing wrong with having stuff. In fact, God blesses us with stuff sometimes. Sometimes we get stuff because we need stuff, and God gives us stuff. Having stuff is not bad. 
Having a nice house or a nice car or a nice bank account is not bad in and of itself. Do you understand that? The Bible and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are not trying to guilt us because of having stuff. That's classism. Jesus is not a classist. He's not, that, he's not who he is. The idea is, is that the focus is on our heart. How do we use our stuff? How do we acquire our stuff? How do we bless others with stuff? How do we, how do we honor God by blessing us with stuff? That's, that's kind of the, the key of what we're talking about today. I have a friend of mine, he has a boat. And he uses this boat for two things. For fishing and for evangelism. And there's not a time I talk to this guy. Every time I talk to this guy, I say, hey man, you been fishing? Yeah, I've been fishing. Would you do any good? Yeah, I took this guy with me. We talked about Jesus for an hour and a half. I didn't catch Dewey's squad. I had a great conversation with this guy. He's getting closer to coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a good use of stuff. That makes me happy. Although, I do know that he knows that I'm born again. And he hasn't took me fishing yet. <laughs> I, I, just in case you're watching, I still want to go fishing before the summer's over with. So, so it's, it's, it's good. It's good to have stuff. Stuff is not bad. He, he blesses us with stuff. He blesses us with opportunities to use our stuff for his glory. My friend is a, is, a, is a fisher of fish, and he's a fisher of men. And I still want to go fishing. The problem isn't having stuff. It's when stuff has us. The, the problem isn't having property. It's when the property owns you. The, the, the problem isn't, isn't having a bank account. It's when your mind is totally focused on that bank account and making more. That's where we start having issues as believers. We need to think about our things, money, relationships, talent, time, uh, and treasure um, with these two ideas in hand. It, is, it, is this temporal? Is it earthly? Is it temporal? Or is it eternal? By the way, in case you didn't know, an investment in, in something that's temporary is a terrible investment. But the investment, an investment in some things that are eternal are a great investment because the return on that investment keeps giving and giving and giving and giving. When you think about your stuff, think about this. Our possessions can be wiped away by a disaster. Any of y'all ever been in a, in, a, in a hurricane? No. I'm thankful for that. Tornadoes here. Tornadoes, tornadoes are here. Yeah. Yeah. Hurricanes are like tornadoes. Except for they're much bigger. Yeah. And there's a, tur that's a hurricane, there's a tornado on top of your house. It ain't much bigger. Don't misunderstand. I'm not trying to make one worse than the other. It's literally this. There's a swath of land 20 miles wide that in one hour is intact. And the sun is shining and the seagulls are flying around going, mine, 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 mine. Things are all as it should be. And 12 hours later, it's laid flat. Nothing is left. Literally, that's how it happens in a hurricane. A natural, a possession can be wiped away by a natural disaster in the blink of an eye. You have no control of it, and the loss is yours to absorb. Number two, one change in the market can crater the value of your home. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you're a homeowner, you're a banker, you know these things. I saw an interesting uh, ad, uh, uh, an app, uh, uh, a position the other day in an in article I was reading about our local housing market. They said something on average in the Fox Valley, houses have seen 35, 37% increase in the last year, something like that, just some insane number. And you know what the increase is for next year? Two. And I, I got, that's a trend if you don't know that. If it's two next year, the year after that, it's probably gonna be negative two or negative 10 or negative 20. The value of your house will go down, but the taxes won't. That's another conversation. We'll keep moving on that. One change in something you have no control over can take away everything that you own. Three, one bad business deal can bankrupt your whole company. It happens all the time. I've never been a, a business owner, but I, I don't know how that feels, but one bad deal can bankrupt your home company. One bad car accident can leave you without a vehicle. Uh, in, in 2021, one pretty not so bad car accident can leave you without a vehicle. We had a friend of ours, I want to restate this carefully. One time we were parked on the street at, at, back in Angleton and, and our car was backed into. It was an accident, no big deal. Dent on the back fender, busted a light, no big deal, right? 
It took, what, three months to get it fixed? Something like that. It was insane the amount of time it took to get it fixed. And we were without a vehicle. We had to figure it out. And God was good. He took care of us. It wasn't a problem. But one little thing out of your control can take away, uh, for ours, it was a $20,000 investment. And lastly, one click on, on a mouse on the internet and your whole identity can be stolen. It, it just take much to lose everything when we're investing things here in the temporal. Jesus is pointing out that all things on this earth, earth that we treasure are temporary. They're fragile and they won't last. If you go to the end of the book, it all burns. It all burns. Everything burns that's up on this world. This world. So the things that you and I stress about, taking care of things, owning this, care, that's taking all, away our, our hearts from things that are eternal and more important, in the end, are not going to be there anyway. This is the lesson that we should be learning. The treasures in heaven, they do not rust. They don't deteriorate. They don't go away. Treasures in heaven do not spoil. The treasures in heaven cannot be stolen. Treasures in heaven cannot be replicated. Treasures in heaven cannot be affected by market trends. I like that part. The treasures in heaven are not affected by the price of a gallon of gasoline or the price of a gallon of milk or the price of a loaf of bread. I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to get started on that. That's bad. It's bad out there. It's tough. But the treasures in heaven are not affected by that. The treasures in heaven are imperishable. They, they cannot perish. They will not go away. They're undefiled. They're unfading. And they are kept in heaven for you. Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. If it was not so, I would have told you so. Paul said in the Thessalonians, I believe it was, that, that I, am, I am, no, it's a to, to Timothy. I am reaching the end of my ministry, my life. My life is being poured out like a drink offering. But I, I'm looking forward to the day when I stand before my Lord Jesus Christ and he gives me that, that crown of glory that I've laid up in heaven. That's my treasure. That's for me from him. That's eternal. That's what, that's what he's focused on. In, in, on earth, Jesus did not have a rock to lay his head on. But he had that. He didn't have a house. He didn't have anything. He didn't own any property. But he knew that this life is very short. It's temporary. It's temporary. Heaven is eternal. He knew that the, that the promises that the Father had for him as, as his son in heaven is worth suffering for today. And that's just a good thought to me. I just really appreciate uh, no, uh, learning those kind of things. So, so you and I need to invest in heavenly riches. So how do we do that? Is there a First National Bank of New Jerusalem in heaven? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if there is or not. But there is a First National Bank of, of heaven here on earth, and it's called the church, and it's called her ministries. Not just the church, not just crossroads, but there are places all around that God's people support with their time, their talents, and their treasures. And don't misunderstand me, Crossroads needs the support as well, but we're not the only one. The important thing is that you and I are faithful to, to the word of God with, and stewarding the stuff that we have. I, 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 don't, I don't, we tithe. We're tithers. But we don't tithe by a number, by a percentage point. We tithe, we get a number from the Lord. This is what I want you to give. This is what I want you to give. And this is the reason why God knows that I'm weaker than water. If I start doing math in my head, I start justifying stuff. It becomes about lists and columns. Well, Jesus, you asked me to give this amount, but I have this bills due. This thing is going on. I don't want to. Protect, I want to savings, and I'm for I want, and all this kind of stuff. And when I start doing it on my own, things tend to fall apart. Next thing you know, I'm, I, don't, I don't have enough. But when I've, I've learned over time that I can be faithful, Jesus said, "Give this number. I give that number, and we're never without." We get close enough to build faith, though, and I like that part. We get close enough to have to trust Jesus. And he's always, always, always come through. Amen. Always. Always. When I'm faithful and I'm a good steward of the stuff that he gives me, he's always faithful to make sure we have our daily bread. He promised it in his word. We talked about that last week. Look, testimony. I've, there has been times in my life 
wipe it down to my negative last cent. That's pretty bad math, but I'm trying to communicate a situation here. And literally, literally, that day, a Jesus check shows up. I don't understand how that worked, but there it was in the mail. It was a refund from an insurance company or something just mundane and not a lot of money, but it was just enough. God is faithful. God is so faithful. There, there, there have been times that, that, uh, that I, I, I prayed for more. I asked for more. And, and, and he provides it. I had a conversation one time with the vice president of Air Gas. You ever heard of Air Gas? Huge company all around the world. Now they're owned by Frenchy people, Air Liquide. Really nice people, but they're French. It's kind of weird. Anyways, I was having a conversation with, the, with, the, with our regional vice president who was giving me the spill, the company spill. Well, you know, you've, been a, you've done a really great job. We thank you for your work, but there's not enough money in the budget for a raise for you. And I didn't even think anything about it. I looked at this man, I looked at him in his eyes, I said, my raise, will I get a raise or don't get a raise? It's not up to you. Amen. And he went, <laughs> you don't understand. It's my decision if you get a raise or not. I said, no, you don't understand. It's not your decision. I don't work for you. And he said, well, what do you mean I don't work for you? I said, I'm a missionary. I, I'm a missionary for Jesus. You're just paying the bills. And if Jesus decides I'm, I need more, I'm going to get more. It has nothing to do with you. And he kind of sat back and he thought and he scratched his chin. We became friends after that. And I told him, I said, I don't need to be rude, but I said, you, need know, you need to know my position. I understand. Sidebar. So we need to invest all that we can in the way that Jesus has called us to invest our talents, our time, and our treasures. Look, you and I have to make a decision. You and I have to make a decision. Are we going to be investors in God's kingdom or are we going to be consumers? Are we going to be an investor or are we going to be a consumer? And let me tell you the difference. A consumer is controlled by circumstances around him that he or she cannot control. An investor has control. A investor is in, an investor is in the driver's seat. When Jesus said, give a number, I give the number, I'm an investor. I'm in control of my faithfulness to my faithful father. And he's in control back to be faithful back to me. That's how that works. If you're a consumer, you have no control whatsoever. You're just receiving and receiving and receiving. If you're not investing, if you have a pile of money that's this deep, and you consume and you consume and you consume, and you consume sooner or later, that pile of money is going to be gone. But if you're an investor in that pile of money, you're going to have all of your needs met plus more, and then that pile will continue to grow. But the good news, the growing pile is not for you. It's for those that you can bless with it. Yep. That's a good way to live. That, that's a good way to live. And someone comes up to you and says, hey, Brother Skip, I have a need. Will 50 take care of it? Oh, more than enough. Well, take the 50 and be blessed and go. I'm not doing without. That's a good way to live. And I've had the conversation. I have a need. It's not on my budget. I don't have it. I can't help you. And I feel like, if I had just not done this thing, maybe I could have been more faithful in helping over here. We're going to be a consumer or we're going to be an investor. It's a simple economic idea. There's a place for eternal investment. Number two, focused for our eyes. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Does anyone ever read that and scratch their head? Is it just me? It's not just me. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate you, man. I'm up here lonely up here. You help me out. That's, that doesn't make any sense in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the carnal, does it? But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Therefore, the light that is in you is the light that is darkness. What is all that about? I'm going to try and unpack this for you. Because I, I had to study on this for a while. Because it was, it's been one of those verses that just kind of read over. And, uh, so we're going to try and unpack that. The lamp of the body is the eye. Now, you're thinking about like a 1924 Ford. With the lights on the front, the lamps on the front, and the light going outwards. Forget that. That's not what he's talking about. The lamp of the body is the eye. Simply, a lamp illuminates the way we are going. It lights up the good path or the bad path. 
The eye as a lamp shows the way the person is going. There's good light and bad light. How does light come in? It comes in, light comes in, and then it refracts off of something, a refractory item, a, a, a shiny object, a prism, and it goes back out even more uh, dense than it was before. Our eye is a lamp, and the lamp shows us the way that we're going to go. Our eyes, because of the intent of our heart, because of our, of, of, of our connection with Jesus, we can either give off good light or we can give off bad light. We can either refract good light, the light of Jesus, Jesus in us, refract that light out of us, and, and go on the path that he lights up, Psalm 1. Or we can be concentrating on things that are carnal, that are of the world, and that light that's refracted of us is light that is dark. It leads us into darkness. And how many of you know leading into light is much better than being led into darkness? Y'all know that, right? Light is better than dark. We want to have lighty light. We don't want darky light. We want lighty light. Light is good. We want to follow Jesus into the light. So what we see, the type of light that we allow into our minds and our body affects everything. What kind of light is going into you is going to, is going to directly, um, directly correlate with the light that's refracting out of you. You can't spend your time looking at things that are of the world, thinking of things that are of the world. I'm not going to make a list. You have your own list. You don't need me to school you on that. But you're not going to spend your time concentrating on those things and express to and expect to refract a positive light. It doesn't work that way. Wherever you're living is what you're going to, what you're going to be expending. That's going to be the light that you follow. And you get to choose, which is the really good news. We tend to gravitate towards the spaces that our hearts are focused on. The good eye focuses on the things of God. The good eye focuses on the things that are of heaven, the things that are eternal. And the good eye, the good life, and the intent is to, with everything, serve God and his kingdom. That's everything. That's what the good eye does. The bad eye focuses on materialism and selfishness and covetousness and stinginess. And that's why Jesus says, how great is that darkness? Remember the binoculars? We must focus on what we want to experience. If you want to experience more of God, you need to focus on God. If you want to experience more of his goodness, you need to focus on his goodness. If you want to experience more of his blessings and his power, you need to focus more on his blessings and his power by the power of his Holy Spirit, by the presence of him in you and us in him, and, and by, the, by, by his God's holy word. That's how you do that. You can't be, and this is the thing that used to confuse me very much. I'm trying to live my life and have a very good time and be a really good person, be a very religious person, but I'm still had dabbling in things that are dark. You can't have it both ways. Or you can try to and you will suffer from it. But there's grace. Amen. It's never too late to change your mind. It's never too late to repent and to, to, go, to focus back on the mark again that God has laid out for you, it's never too late. This is not the end of the story for any of us, and I'm really thankful for that. Remember the binoculars. We must focus on what we want to experience. If I want to experience, a, the state bird of Wisconsin is a robin. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I've been studying. If I want to focus on a robin, and I want to take my binoculars out. I want to look at the robin. And I want to just, just admire and just be impressed by the beauty of a robin. I can't look at a rock. Because a rock and a robin are not the same thing. I can focus on a rock. And I can call the robin all I wanted. Right? Y'all feeling me? It doesn't make it a robin. But we tend to do that as well. But I really love that person. Never mind. Don't keep moving. We focus on the rock. we got to focus on the robin. We have to be looking exact at exactly what we want to be part of our mind and our heart. We have to focus on it. What are you focusing on? What is your value? What, what do you hold in the highest esteem? It's a rhetorical question. I can't answer that for you. But I hope that you can answer that for yourself. You have to, we have to aim at what we want. We want to be children of light, not children of darkness. We cannot do both. We are not spiritual chameleons. Look at this guy. <laughs> chameleons are the coolest thing ever. What do you notice about his eyeballs? 
Got one going this way and one going that way. Pardon me, be healed. We have one moving up this way. And one. We're like that. We want to focus on heaven. We got one eye focused on heaven, and we're doing our heavenly thing and doing our churchy thing and doing our religious thing, but one eye's focused on the world. And we're trying to trying to do both. You, you just can't do it. It's not supportable. We're not spiritual chameleons. We need both of our spiritual eyes focused in the same direction. Focused on the same direction. And, and they had better be focused on God. If, if there's anything keeping you from focusing on godly living, clear it out. And by the way, can I, can, can I just, just share just a little bit? You and I have to be very careful about the things that we allow into our mind. Now, there's the obvious things. I'm not going to make that list. That's, I'm not going to do that. The obvious things are things we do not need to be consuming as believers. But we have to be careful about Christian romance novels. Yep. <laughs> we have to be careful about Christian romance movies. Now, I'm not against romance. I'm a big fan. I'm not very, I'm not very good at it, ask my wife. But I, I love romance. Yeah, I love with my wife. I'm not going to allow my mind to enter into a, that, that kind of relationship with another human being. Not for a second. I, I don't want to. So just because something has the word Christian in front of it, don't necessarily make it Christian. I read somewhere recently that the, that the Christian niche market is like an $8 billion market. We get marketed by marketers to buy things that they want us to buy. That's, right. That's being a consumer. <laughs> I want to uh, uh, encourage you to be an investor. And you buy things and spend your money and your resources your time and your talents and your treasures in places that God has placed you and in places that God has placed to be most important to you and to his kingdom, right? There's a difference. Anything that's keeping you from focusing on God, clear it out. Have you ever woke up in the morning? Have you ever woke up in the morning and you got those things in your eyes? Right. Yeah. Sometimes you get them in both eyes. Sometimes if you're not feeling, <laughs> sometimes if you're feeling not, well, I heard that, that's not helpful. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you get it so bad that it's all across your eyelashes and you can't even open your eyes like if you have hay fever or cold or something. Yeah. That's the worst place to be. Yeah. Sometimes if you sleep really hard or with your mouth open like me, you get in the corners of your mouth, it's disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. There, there, there's a word for that. It's, it's called R-H-E-U-M. 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 And what it actually is, it's mucus that forms in the corners of your eyes. But it does a good thing. When you're sleeping, this mucus coats your eyes, and as you're in REM sleep, your eyes are going all over the place, and it cleans out your eyes, and then all that gunky, goofy stuff, it coagulates in the corner of your eyes, so, it's, so your eyes stay healthy. So gunk in your eyes is a good thing. <laughs> the next time you wake up with boogers in your eyes, you need to thank Jesus for that. That's because he loves you. And by the way, can I just point out that the idea of, 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 of something being formed up from the primordial ooze can come up and have eye boogers at the same time doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense at all. I and mean, if that was the case, you would just nasty in your eyes would stay nasty in your eyes, and your eyes would probably not work past the age of 25. So be thankful for eye boogers. I'm not going to wait for with that, Bob. I could do that for a while. I'm not going to do that. So... And, but did you notice, have you ever noticed, though, that the very first thing that we do when we wake up, when we wake up in the morning and our eyes are covered with eye gunk, is we get that gunk out of our eyes. We rub our eyes or we go wash our face and it goes right away. Because why? Because we want to see clearly. We want our eyes to be free of dirt and debris. We get rid of that gunk. You and I need to do the very same thing spiritually. When you have spiritual gunk in your eyes, get it out. Rub them eyes and get it clear. Put some fresh, holy, living water on your face and get free of the stuff that's holding us down. We need to do that. Amen. I hope that the next time, in the morning, morning when you wake up and you have eye boogies in your eyes, that you remember that. You praise the Lord for it. You remember that. And you get in that eye gum that you're cleaning out the world out of your eyes and your mind and you want to clear it away so that you have a really good sight on Jesus.
More importantly, what in your life is causing that spiritual jump that's making Jesus hard to focus on? Is it your possessions? Is it pride? <coughs> Arrogance? Fear? Apathy? Addiction? Tolerance of sin? <clears throat> that's all spiritual content. All spiritual content. Moving on, number three. We have focus for our lives. Verse 24 says in chapter 6, Matthew, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. You can't do it. You can't do it. Back to the idea of the chameleon. He can't focus on two things at once. And he can focus on two things at once, but you and I cannot. We can't serve two masters. We can only be slaves, Sunday school class. We can only be slaves to one <coughs> or the other. You're not going to be slaves to both. It's illogical. It doesn't even make any sense. We're going to, be, we're going to serve one, serve the other, we're going to love one, or, and hate the other. But we cannot serve two masters. We cannot be controlled by God or by our stuff. We can't be controlled by both eternal and the temporal. Now Jesus said that we cannot serve God or mammon. Now just what is mammon? It's a very interesting word. I did a lot of research on this word and, and there's a lot of different ideas and I certainly can't go into all of them. But, but Jesus used the term as a personification of riches, prosperity, and wealth. It's, that's not, a, that's not eternal. Mammon is, is, is uh, prosperity and riches and wealth that do not come from him. In the way, in the, way the language lays out is very interesting, and, and Robert Morris has a very interesting teaching on this. It's called The Blessed Life. It's a whole series. I hope you get a chance to do that in our church one day. It's a really great study. But Robert Morris says this. Robert Morris says mammon is a demon. It's a very interesting thought to me. And, and, and honestly, I believe that it's true. It's a very interesting thought to me. Look at the way the sentence is laid up. You can't serve God, a very specific entity, or mammon. And the, the mammon is identifying all of this, this earthly, worldly stuff. So the, Jesus is basically saying, you're going to serve heaven or you're going to serve the earth. You're going to serve God, or you're going to serve God, the opposite of God. You're going to serve Christ, you're going to serve the end. You're going to serve something, but ultimately, mammon always ends up, if you extrapolate the idea, it always ends up being an idol. It always ends up being an idol. Now think about that. Think about a mammon as a personification of riches, prosperity, wealth, um, etc. Boats, or whatever it is that's keeping you from serving God, or taking all of your money, your time away. It becomes an idol because you have to serve those ideas. You have to serve those things to keep them up, to be able to control them, to have them. You have to serve those things. And so it becomes an idol. And an idol is anything that gets in the way of you and your relationship with God. Anything that gets in the way of you and your relationship with God. By the way, did God, did God sanctify marriage? Yes, God is a fan of marriage. God says marriage is good. But God is, is not a fan of a, of a marriage that involves a person well, one person is married to another because they idolize that person, not because they love them in, in, in the way Jesus would call us to love. You understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Things that are good can still be idols. It's okay to have a car. Cars are great. Your car can be an idol. I have a friend of mine, his father, he's third generation in a car business. They used to have a Volkswagen dealership way back in the days of his grandpa's. Now he has a Chevrolet dealership in Lake Jackson, Texas. And his father, Gary, good man, godly man, a good man, knew that his son were one day going to be in the car business. That's just how that works. But they would have the opportunity if they wanted to. And you know how they started learning about the car business? With a toothbrush in the showroom, polishing that car. They learned. They learned the hard way of what it means to be in the, in, in the car business. But some people do that for fun, not as their job, because they idolize their car. Guess if that car is more, is more important to you than, than what the things that God has. In other words, what, well, pastor, you know what? I, I, I would I would tie, but but I have an $850 truck payment to make. I only make 
$1,200 a week or $1,200 a month. So I got a problem. You see what I'm saying? That becomes an idol. It becomes an idol. And guess what? God hates idolatry. He hates it, whatever form or fashion it is. He hates idolatry. My job for me in my life is to identify things that possibly become idols and destroy them, to get rid of them, to search, seek, and destroy. Because idols will take your mind off the goodness of God and take you down a path of dark life that you don't want to go. You can't serve God and mammon in the same way you can't be a husband of two wives. You, you can't devoutly follow the badgers and the gophers. You can't have two favorite movies. You can't love the Astros and the Brewers. Yeah, you can. No, you can't. And no, you cannot. Because I've tried and I've been, I've been. You can't love the Packers and the Bears. Well, that is true. Thank you. <laughs> it's just not possible or is it advisable. You can't love God and stuff at the same time. You can love God and have stuff, but you can't love God and love stuff. We'll love one and hate the other. We must be focused on how we're living. We must be focused on what we're consuming. We must be focused on God, his kingdom, and his mission. I have a friend of mine. I have lots of friends. He had a house in Alvin, a small little town in Texas, and God, God told him, sell your house, move 25 miles south to a new town, and buy a house that's twice as big as you need with the money I'm going to provide. And my friend, my friend Neil, he's a thinker. The guy's smart with money. He's incredible. He, 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 he looks at, he looks at a, a, a balance sheet and just, well, this is wrong. Yeah. This is where they are. He's just really, really smart like that. And the idea that he would venture into this thing on faith to buy a house that's too big for him is completely outside of his nature. It's not his nature. I have two kids. I have a small wife. She's very small. She's about this big, cute as a bud. I love her to death. I don't need a big house. I'm good 13, 1,400 square feet to come in a two-car garage and a fenced backyard for my dog. I'm good. But he bought a house that's probably over 3,000 square feet and no fence either, by the way, which is kind of odd. And this is the reason why. He took the, up, the this upstairs of this house had a room it's probably a quarter size of this room. It's huge. It is a huge room. And he's taken that room and he's redone it. He's redecorated. He's rebuilt it. Put in new air conditioning systems in the whole nine yards. And he's got like room for 12 people to sleep in there. If, if you're traveling through, if you're a missionary on furlough, if you're, if you're a member of his family, if you're anybody in the neighborhood that needs a place to stay, you've got a place to stay in Neil's house. Oh, and by the way, he also built the table that seats 12 people. Maybe more. Maybe 16, huh? I think it's like 16 people. He built it with his own hands. He's got two small girls. They're this big. And his wife's only this big. I know, I'm sorry. I'm in trouble. He's going to bust me out. But he built a table for 16 people. He's matching the room upstairs. The mission that God has laid out for him in this house is to serve the kingdom of God and people who are in need. He's got a compassionate heart. And by the way, he can barbecue a brisket like nobody's business. <laughs> you can do that too. I love you, Neil. I miss you, buddy. We have to be focused on the things that God has called us to do. And when He calls you to do something bigger than you think you're, than you're able to do, you need to follow Him anyways. Because He's not going to let you down. He's not going to lead you to a place of failure. He may lead you to a place of suffering. He may lead you to a place of learning and growing and, and becoming larger in your faith. But you're not going to fail if you continue to follow Him. Fact. Amen. Fact. Straight fact. <laughs> So, in conclusion, I believe the implications of the focus of our hearts, the focus of our eyes, and the focus of our lives go far beyond money. This is a spiritual issue. But it is possessions and stuff that Jesus is talking about here in Matthew. You remember that Jesus said, say, come and follow me, or forgive me, I have to go home and bury my father. Please excuse me, I need to go and plow some new land I just bought that I haven't seen yet. Please, please excuse me, I have, I have to go work a double shift so I can make my house mortgage. Please forgive me because I have to uh, uh, 
to spend some money or to make some money so I can fix my boat. Having a house or a boat is not bad, but if it's owning you, that's when it becomes a problem. It's possession and stuff that Jesus is talking about, and money and stuff has a very high place in our culture. Listen, money is not bad. 1 Timothy 6.10 says this, for the love of money is a, is a root of all kinds of evil. For which some have strayed from their faith and their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. <laughs> Anybody ever look at their balance sheet and say, man, I don't know. I got all these payments for all this stuff. I don't make that much money. I can't do it all. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Money's not evil in and of itself. Look, we collect money every week here in our church. We don't want evil things in our church. Money is, it can be used for the glory of God. Look, give as much money as you can. And give as much money as you can. Give, get as much stuff and money as you can, but give God the glory for all of it. Amen. Invest in his kingdom and store up eternal treasures for yourself. Bob, if you... And then the team want to come and get, get ready to put on worship some more when we're done. Look, invest in his kingdom and store up eternal treasures for himself. Do you remember in Daniel talking about the storehouses? That's the storehouses is for you and for me. When you and I invest in the kingdom faithfully as God called us to do, our riches are laid up in that storehouse. And brother and sister, Believe me, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you have a need, the windows and the doors of the storehouse can be opened. Mm -hmm. You know that. Mm -hmm. That's where that investment comes to play. So Jesus is not trying to keep us away from good things. He's not being a spoil sport. He's not trying to keep you away from nice things. But what he is doing is he's showing us a better way to live, a way that is focused on his eternal kingdom and not the elusive temp kingdom of temporal stuff. Honestly, it's a new level of freedom. It's made possible and available through us by his death and by his resurrection. Look, losing focus on ourselves and gaining complete focus on him and his mission is the goal of my life in Christ, and it should be the goal in your life in Christ as well. My question to you is, what are you focused on? What are you focused on? Play something pretty there, buddy. What are you focused on? What are the things that has your attention? What are the things that's keeping you from investing in eternal things? It's a serious question I want you to ask yourself. Will you give another dime to, to the crossroads between you and Jesus? That's not what this is about. This is about you being free. This is about you being free and not caught up and entrapped by stuff that's going to burn. It doesn't matter. So let's all stand together, and we're going to pray, and then we're going to sing. If you have a need, I'd like to come forward. The altars are open for every single person in this room. Come forward and pray. If you want me to pray with you, I'll be glad to pray with you. Another woman or another gentleman to pray with you, just grab them up and bring them up to the altars, and y'all pray. Pray right there where you're sitting at. Maybe you're one who don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Maybe you're one who needs to understand how God has called you to be, to be something more than you ever thought you were able to be. This is your time to do business with Jesus. Let's, uh, let's worship together.